This episode of I Was There Too is brought to you by my buddies at Mack Weldon who make the underwear, the socks, the t-shirts, the sweatshirts, the sweatshirts, which is a mint for your skin pores, and also sweatshirts. Go to MacWeldon.com right now and use promo code WASTHERE, W-A-S-T-H-E-R-E, and get 20% off. And what's more, I'm so confident that you'll enjoy Mac Weldon's clothing that if you screenshot me proof of purchase using the promo code WASTHERE and email it to me at IWASTHERE2POD at gmail.com, I'll write you a small underwear poem. Well, I didn't think about that before I offered it, but I'm going to stick to it. Go to MacWeldon.com, use promo code WASTHERE, and get great socks, t-shirts, underwear, hoodies, and more. Many of them antimicrobial. MacWeldon.com. Underwear for poems. Hey, poem smells best. In the evening it's not worth believing what you heard. About three or four seasons? They're up for sale if you want them. Let me see your identification. You don't need to see his identification. We don't need to see his identification. These aren't the droids you're looking for. These aren't the droids we're looking for. He can go about his business. You can go about your business. Move along. Move along. Move along. That's right. Today and I was there too. It's the These Aren't the Droids We're Looking For Stormtrooper. My name's Matt Gorley, and this is the show where I talk to people present in the great scenes of cinema history. And today's episode begins one of a trilogy. One of a trilogy that I've wanted to tackle since the beginning of this podcast. The original Star Wars trilogy. We're leading up to 50 episodes here of I Was There Too, and I thought, why not walk up those steps with three of my favorite films. Today, Star Wars. My guest, Anthony Forrest, who played the aforementioned Sand Trooper, I guess technically, that has the exchange with Ben Kenobi and Luke Skywalker about the droids that they are indeed looking for. After seeing the documentary Elstree 1976, I thought Anthony's story and how he ended up playing this role as well as the role of Luke's friend Fixer in the deleted scenes that you can see on YouTube or on the Blu-ray would be a fascinating story. And I was not wrong. This episode of I Was There Too is the classic style where I talk to someone who was indeed there too. The next episode, Empire Strikes Back, will be someone that was there as well, but not in the way you might think. And the role which they played might even have a little controversy surrounding it. What does that mean? <laughs> You're going to have to tune in. And then in a month, I'll wrap up this trilogy with the Return of the Jedi episode. But let's get back to this episode, which is a real corker, because first of all, my guest wasn't only two characters in Star Wars. He was also in the James Bond film, The Spy Who Loved Me, and was present at the John Lennon, Yoko Ono, Peace and Love campaign, Bed In. This guy was everywhere for everything. He was around the Beatles, the James Bond franchise, Star Wars. He's like the pop culture Forrest Gump without being Forrest Gump. You get my point. And then, as if it weren't enough, right after this interview, we're going to talk more with secret guest Starship One about her audition for Episode 8 of the new Star Wars trilogy. I just wasn't satisfied with talking with her before, and I wanted to know more. And after that, a classic Star Wars superego sketch featuring the brown X-Wing squadron. All this and more, today, on a very special Star Wars trilogy I was there too. But... Before we begin, make sure to join me this October 28th through 30th at the Now Hear This Podcast Festival where I will be doing a live episode of this show with guest Mark Marin, and we'll talk about his film, Almost Famous. There will be surprises. It will be great. Okay, I'm really excited to begin the run-up to the 50th episode, which will hopefully, if things are going as planned, will be a great surprise. And these three episodes leading up to it are going to be a lot of fun. Thank you for joining me on this 50-episode journey. God, you're great. Here we go. The film 
Star Wars. The year, 1977. The role, the these aren't the droids you're looking for, Stormtrooper. The actor, Anthony Forrest. Well, Anthony Forrest, let me start with this because for reasons I will not go into, I own a Stormtrooper suit. They're incredibly <laughs> clumsy and unwieldy costumes. The first time I got in it, I thought to myself, never again. Was it tough getting around in that thing and actually having to act and hit a mark? Uh, I was uh, one of the first things that occurred to me, and, and this is when I when they put the, the 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 plates on me, which was the armor plates and things like that. Is is I was getting pinched left, right, and center, my, my <laughs> behind the kneecaps, in the elbow joints. So it was it was really uncomfortable. And is uh, I've I've mentioned this a couple of times before to people. Is uh, I had a, a really bad sunburn at the time. Oh wow! <laughs> it was not. It was not something I was really looking forward to. I, I, I had no idea I was going to be doing it, but it, but I hadn't anticipated. So I'd been out in the sun the first uh, a day before that, and uh, the the sun in Tunisia, because there's a breeze that blows, it's it's uh, very misleading. You can get burnt <laughs> quite quickly. Yeah. So can you tell me the story about how you ended up as the Sand Trooper? Because as we'll discuss in a minute, you were cast as Luke's friend Fixer. Right. But how did it come to be that you ended up being this famous stormtrooper? The um, – it was – perhaps it was just being at the right place at the right time or some – I don't really understand the situation that arose out of it. Um, or why I had a feeling perhaps it was Alec Guinness had requested that an actor actually an actor come in and do the scene with him mm. um, because the people who were on the set at that time um, were stuntmen and and local uh, Tunisians who were, who were working as extras and so um, just perhaps it was he'd asked or, or or maybe George thought it was was a good idea to have somebody actually come in and play this scene because it's a crucial scene I mean in the sense that it's the first time people experience the uh, the the power of the force through yeah, the Jedi mind trick. It really is. It's not only crucial to the story, but it's also an iconic scene in terms of it's kind of one of the first comedic scenes as well. And so what was your experience like with Alec Guinness, this master thespian, and how much did you guys discuss the rhythm and the pace, or was it just pretty quick? Um, it was, it was. I mean, it, in general terms, it was pretty quick, but then again, it's, it's. you're always waiting around simply for setups and different camera angles and things like that. But we did have a chance, I had a chance to, to, to briefly talk with him, and he was a very generous, kind man. I mean, he was, uh, he was very graceful in, in understanding that I was just stepping into this situation out of nowhere. Um, and so he, uh, you know, as you will see, as you can see from the scene, he pretty much leads it. Yeah. Um, what I was trying to do is I was trying to take my fixer hat off because I'd only been thinking about fixer ever since I got the role. So I was, I was working on, fi you know, creating as actors do, you create all these backstories and things like that. So I was trying to understand how fixer fitted into all of this scenario. And so all of a sudden I had to put that aside and, and kind of get my head around what was a, a stormtrooper or a sand trooper and what was going on in this scene. So I think he appreciate. I think he appreciated the fact that I was just diving into this and and, uh, and and kind of be you know pitch hitting at this stage. What was the mood like with him? You said he was very generous, but he was also just this veteran Shakespearean actor. Was there ever a sense that he was above the production or unhappy that he was doing what at the time was just a kind of an unknown sci-fi film? No, I don't. I never got that feeling from him at all. No. You know, he, as a master craftsman, you know he's a he's a total perfect. You're a total professional, and he was, you know, he he steps into the role and he makes it his own. Yeah. And I still think today we see that. I think he had a really good understanding of of what, uh, you, you know, the role that Obi Wan was playing in this story, and you know he was really the, you know. He, as as a master act, you know, as a master performer and and, and an actor, I think he was bringing to it that part of of, of the power of the Jedi, uh, you know, completely in control. <laughs> How long did it take to shoot this scene? Uh, my rec my re like recollection seems that it didn't really feel like like it took that long. It was ba basically I, I'm thinking it was possibly the latter part of a morning into the afternoon. 
Hmm. When I arrived, uh, everything was pretty well set up in terms of they'd already been, sh- you know, they'd already been co- doing a lot of coverage and things like that. And so I was really pretty much hustled into the situation. Um, Robert Watts had come to get me at the hotel, um, said George wanted to see me. We, when we arrived, George was actually walking towards the car with a script in his hand <laughs> and said, he, he, you know, he looked at me and he, he was looking a little bit anxious, as, <laughs> as you know, most, most directors are in terms, you know, you've got, a, you've got a schedule to keep and you've got a timeline and you're trying to get all this coverage and you're fighting the elements, you know, especially when you're on location like that. And so you're trying to get your day's work done. And, and so he was looking a little bit anxious and, and he said, can you do me a favor? Nobody's going to know what, you know, you'll be in this costume. Can you play this scene? And so me being the, the gung ho type, I said, sure, let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> when you talk, when you talk about Lucas that way, I watch behind the scenes footage of him on star Wars and reading about how the crew sometimes maybe didn't respect him as much as they should. I feel for the guy so much. It's his first huge film. I mean, he had done American graffiti, but I believe you once said that you asked him how he likes directing. And he said, I don't, I like to write. So what was your take on him on the whole when he was directing? Uh, he's, George is quite quiet. He's, he's not, you know, there's some directors who are out there and, you know, throwing commands around and, and uh, managing it like a general. Um, George, George comes, I think, from, it, from a much more cerebral perspective as a writer. Um, I think that's what he's, he's trying to tell his story. And I think one of the things that, 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 that you have to really respect about George, he had a vision and he had to, he was continually trying to, you know, and, and sticking to that vision. Wanting, you know, it's it's not stubbornness. It's just being cl- having the clarity of wanting to fulfill what you see and what your vision is as as both a writer and a storyteller. That's one of my favorite things about this film, as opposed to the two that follow. Is I swear you can almost feel the just the drive in Lucas and what he was struggling against. Even down to now, this is going to get into the real minutia. But I noticed on your costume, there's one shot where you've got a big piece of black duct tape on the shoulder that then just disappears. And I don't know if, do you remember why that was there? Was the suit falling apart or how? Yeah, it, it, it was falling apart. This is what I have to have. I noticed because I have to watch these scenes over and over and suddenly you see things pop out that you never would have before. Right, right. It's, it's um, you know, these costumes were, were not made for running around. They, <laughs> these are, you know, these, these are camera ready. And, and so it's, you're not necessarily going to go walking, you know, through the shopping mall in them or anything like that. It's, it's really, Really down to the fact that they were props and the, uh, the work that was being done in Tunisia was really the first first line of props that were made and so they hadn't really been battle tested right so the stormtroopers are obviously dubbed for the final film what was your back and forth like there on the day with Guinness did you have to shout through that horrible helmet or how did yeah. that work yeah I was I was um, I was as you as you probably aware, you're going to do reverse camera roll angles and things like that. So yeah, I was shouting through the through the helmet, and then the when the when you do the reverses, you can actually take the helmet off because it's like over the shoulder or it's another angle, right? And so you can actually have a a proper vocal at that time, so you can actually hear each other. And one of the things when I first going back to the costume, when I first put the 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 bucket is is a lot of sand troopers uh, fans like to call it. Um, when I first put it, when I had put it on, I couldn't see a thing. Uh, <laughs> every time I, I turned left to look, uh, the the helmet went right. Every time I turned right, it went left. And so it was. I was like, a, I really felt a little bit like a, you know the bobblehead you get in the back of your car. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I felt like one of those like bobblehead dogs in in the back of a car. And, and so I was a little bit. Uh, I was really just try- I was doing a couple of different things. Also, when they put the 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 the, the backpack on, they I, f- I felt almost maybe they'd filled it with sand because I almost fell over backwards because I didn't I hadn't gauged what it was like moving around in the costume, and so when they put it on, I was started rolling backwards, not not onto the ground, but I could feel my I could feel my body weight because I was in <laughs> sand at the time, just being dra- pulled backwards. So there was a there was a lot of adjustment I was doing physically trying to understand how I could actually f- make this feel real and and not robotic i can't imagine how you guys do it because like i said having been in one of those suits i found it really difficult to walk through my own house which i know the geog- the geography of especially right. like it's so easy to see why that one stormtrooper hits his head in the death star which i believe was uh someone else that was interviewed in that documentary l street 1976 which you feature heavily in right right yeah that's how i found you i found your story so compelling <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, it's 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 uh, it, uh, John Spira, who, who the director, wonderful, uh, good interviewer, great interviewer, and, and a good good uh, documentary filmmaker. And, and John was very sweet and kind, and 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 giving us all, I think, a chance to just explain some of <laughs> some of our experiences. Do you have any idea who ended up dubbing your voice? Because I know that the actor Harry Shearer did a lot of imperial voices and that sort of thing, and I, it almost sounds like it could be him, but I wouldn't know. Yeah, it, there's, um, it, there's a, there was an, somebody that was hired in who was uh, working in San Francisco. Right. Um, and I'm sure because that's where Lucasfilm was based. Um, they were obviously working with various people who were, who were there. I, it, so it's... Uh, you know that escapes me. I'm trying to think now who that is, or because I know there's one, a couple of people who are brought in to do a lot of coverage on a lot of different lines and things like that. Interesting. All right, let's talk about your role as Fixer. You uh, famously played Fixer, the guy who runs Tashi Station, the place we've very memorably heard about from Luke. You also refer to him as the Fixer. Is there a story behind that character's name or origin? You said that you had come up with a backstory for him. Tell us what you remember. Um, I hadn't really uh, seen that the fixer. I, see, I hadn't read the comic the, or or the the other background material. I had I didn't have any access to that. Um, so in the script, I was just looking at it as fixer, and and the uh, Lays Lozoner w- was kind of a, another handle, or that's the full name and description. Right, that's your full name, right? Lays Fixer. Lozona, right? Yeah. So Fixer was really, I guess, you know, it's it's a nickname. It's the same as, you know, a lot of people have nicknames. And so Fixer was really a nickname, mainly because Fixer was responsible for, for repairing things. He He's somebody who you would repair, you know, uh, droids or repair... Uh, in the film, there's a moment where Lucas tells Uncle Owen that he's going to collect the power converters. Right. And then it cuts from there. Well, that's basically, I, I'm pretty sure that's, if I remember from the script, that's where that cut cutaway would actually go to uh, meeting up with Fixer. Okay, that makes sense, yeah. And all of this is available on YouTube. You should check it out. Yeah, and, and going to Tashi Station. So that that that... That led me when I was reading reading the script. That led me to believe that Fixer was this guy who was this kind of mechanic, just kind of repair guy who would repair something like you know that was broken, like a land speeder, or and he was running Toshi Station like a clubhouse, but it was also his repair center. Yeah, now that's uh, Fixer's occupation. But I want to talk. Let's get into the man because I, I'm so fascinated by this. In the scene when your girl Cammy takes Luke's binoculars and he goes to get them back, your character, right. you walk past him and you just give him the look like, step off, man. And then you go and just hover over Cammy like a real hound dog. Was this a choice in the script or was it something that you brought to it? No, that's that's something. I, <laughs> say, one of the things that occurred to me is is uh, this is a, a a fairly isolated area. Uh-huh. There's not, you know, you're. this is like talking about, you know, you could be anywhere in, you know, somewhere in the outback or something like that. And this is an isolated area. And here's this, this uh, beautiful Cammy, and she's probably the only girl around for maybe a couple of hundred miles. And so he's very, I figure he's amongst all the, the group, he's fairly protective of her and their relationship. And I also thought that that was perhaps one of the reasons he wasn't interested in going to fight the big battles and get involved in all of that stuff. He had a, he already had a setup. He had a girlfriend. He had he had a location which was the clubhouse. He had friends coming around, and so he was fairly stable in in that uh, in that situation. So I always felt he would be quite protective of anybody kind of leaning on 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 his girlfriend. That is really fascinating. I wonder sometimes if this scene really could be used in the film because there's a moment where Cammy calls Luke wormy and you seem very dismissive of him. And it goes a long way to making us see the humble beginnings of Luke, that he's not all that well-respected and where he comes from. And I could see how leaving this scene in would make his character's arc even greater. Did you guys discuss those dynamics of the scene and your take of your character versus him and the status and all that stuff? Um, we, there wasn't, we didn't really discuss too much about that. It was really, you know, one of the things that, that, uh, that directors, you know, I, I think, and it's a smart thing that, that a lot of directors do, is they wait to see what actors bring to the scene. Mm-hmm. To see, you know, it's a question of, as an actor, you do your homework 
and then you, it's your responsibility to bring something. And then the director can look at that and shape it from there. So usually, uh, you know, a lot of directors will not step in until they see what you're bringing to it. And, and so, you know, they want to see how it plays out. It, it plays out, first of all, before they actually step in and, and start giving comments or giving directions. Do you prefer that type of directing style as opposed to someone who's a lot more hands-on? Because every report is that Lucas is very hands-off in terms of acting with his actors. Is that yeah, true? Yeah, yeah, because he's, uh, he's, he's uh, I think his, he's, he's probably much more involved in, in getting the aspects of the atmosphere and the environments and the, the, the sense of the space that you're in. Yeah. Whereas allowing the actors, you know, and so you're not getting a lot of, you know, personal direction in that respect. And so it does allow you the freedom to, to, to open up. And, and I've always wanted to take risks. And so it's kind of nice to be able to take those challenges because, you know, like the, the way you described before how I move in on Cami and stuff like those are, those are kind of my, my, you know, my personal choices in, in trying to, um, just trying to, in a very, because it's only a short scene, so in a very short scene, you don't have a lot of time as an actor to try and, and develop or, or get the character across. You've got to come in and, and nail it right away for an audience. Yeah. And how was it working with Mark Hamill? Oh, Mark is great. <laughs> Mark, I always think, you know, I think there's a, a golden opportunity because Mark has is, is got a great sense of humor, and I, I'd love to see him do some comedy. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah, he really does. And I think, you know, I wish somebody, you know, would pick pick that up because he's, he's uh, Mark's a lot of fun. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Uh, how did you end up in this film in the first place? What was your casting process? I was, um, at the time, I had done a TV series, uh, which was Anne of Avonlea, their sequel to Anne of Green Gables uh, for the BBC. And uh, I had then done a whole series of TV commercials with Ridley Scott when Ridley Scott was, this is prior to his feature film career. He was, there, a number of directors at that time were very successful in, in the commercials market in the UK. Uh, Ridley Scott, Adrian Lynn, um, Alan Parker, um, Hugh Hudson, uh, and they were, they were all making a lot of headway and all really starting to branch over from uh, being commercial directors. And so I got cast in a series of commercials that Ridley Scott was directing um, and from that, I had picked up a, a, a very good agent and it was through that, through things like that, that I actually got called in uh, by Irene Lamb to meet George Lucas. And I, I couldn't remember whether or not I'd been cast in The Eagle Has Landed before uh, Star Wars or after it, because uh, The Eagle Has Landed shot in the summer of, I believe it shot 76 or 75 I'd have to go back through the annals. I haven't really looked at it that closely. But she, she, she was a casting director on both The Eagle Has Landed and on Star Wars. And so I got, I got called in to, to have this meeting with, uh, in Soho Square, and, and that was the first time I met George Lucas. So within the space of a year, you're working with Ridley Scott, George Lucas, John Sturgis. I mean, that must have been a hell of a time for you. Oh, it was, you know, I've always been... I've always loved the, the opportunity to also learn the whole process of filmmaking. So I've always been interested in what goes on behind the camera as much as I am on what's in front of the camera. And it, it was a great, you know, these, the opportunity with John Sturgis, wow, this is, you know, this is one of the great directors of all time. Um, and so the, these, you know, when you watch these directors and you work, you know, you get the opportunity to, to, to stand on the sidelines and see the process. I mean, John Sturgis said something to me once I asked him about directing. And I, I, maybe I was just, you know, maybe it's just me having the gall to actually ask people there these questions, like <laughs> asking George, you know, whether you, you know, how do you like directing? And he says, I don't, I like to write. Um, the, uh, I'd asked George, John Sturgis about directing, and he said, you know, he, he, he it was it was very uh, curt and wonderful in the way he says, uh, no, I um, if I haven't got it in two takes, I, I changed the setup. What? He really? was, yeah, he was very much about you, you go in, you know, this is the moment, um, and it helps. That it's actually interesting when when directors do that because if you know you've got a limited amount of time to work your game is on. You've yeah, only got that moment. You've only got very brief moments to pull it off. 
and make it happen. You probably have a theater background too, where you understand the immediacy of the you know one performance yeah, per night. So I yeah, could see where that might yeah, be that, a good. Yeah, limit. I, I started in theater, and so you, you, that that really gets your 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 focus right to the to the key level, um, and you know you bring your A game right off the bat. And and that, that's why I said it's nice when when directors you know you do have a little bit of, of leeway to to actually to to work on the character. I haven't really had that opportunity you know in terms of of, of scope of role to take a role all the way through a film. Mm-hmm. You know where you take it you know where where you have so much uh, participation in the film you're really you're really you know you're working with a very large arc. Right. And I haven't had that opportunity. As a director, I've done that with other actors, but I haven't had that opportunity as an actor to actually take a character all the way through that arc. Are you still acting? I do, yeah. I mean, I haven't really done... Uh, a couple of people ask me to do things, but I've been a little bit reticent, mainly because um, I've, I've been busy with my own material, but at the same time, um, I haven't had an agent for a number of years now, so not having an agent hasn't really led to, to the opportunity, you know, the opportunity to get in front. And also the process is very different now. Not very often do you get a chance to sit down with a director and meet a director. When, you know, in, in the 70s um, into the 80s, the process was very much more about actually sitting down physically with the director and actually getting to, to either do a reading or getting to, you know, the director getting to get a feel of who you are as, a per, as, a, as an individual as well. Um, now, very much a lot of stuff is done on tape and everything wants to be submitted on tape. So it, it's, it's a lot more like casting commercials than it is casting features. Obviously, the larger main roles, then the directors come in and, and they will sit down with the actors and, you know, and, and talk it through and, and see how everybody's feeling and see if everybody's on the same page as well. Did you know that your fixer scenes had been cut prior to seeing the movie for the first time or did you find out by watching it? I found out by watching it. And so what yeah. were your thoughts on that? I mean, it must have been bittersweet seeing what an amazing movie that you're a part of. I mean, Star Wars itself is probably the greatest pop culture event in the history of mankind. I think you could make that argument, maybe rivaled only by the Beatles. And there you are, a part of history, but then this scene isn't in there. Yeah. What were you thinking? <laughs> <laughs> well, it, there's, a, there's an element of disappointment, but there's also an element of... Uh, of uh, I'd already done a fair amount of work um, and right, and again, understanding the the being interested in the process of filmmaking and understanding what what goes through. You know, f- I always look at it from the point of view of film is often made three times: once in the writing stage, second when you're shooting it. it you can make a you know from script to shoot to actually production it can be it can become a, a very different film when you're actually filming, and then the final stage, which is in the editing, and you can retell the whole story in a completely different way in the editing process. <laughs> And and that's the interesting thing about film. You can actually take your what is the basis of a story and retell it three different times, right? In different ways. Um, and so I'm I'm very I've always tried to be very realistic in knowing about these things happen, and you don't always end up in films, even though, you know, there's a lot of very well known actors who have who have had scenes cut out of films, and just simply because of the process that that they're involved in. Length of film, various reasons. The scene doesn't work. Uh, it's slowing the film down. There's all sorts of reasons. Yeah, and I've heard you say, too, that it's almost, in some ways, better that Fixer was cut because you have this story to tell, and there's kind of a <laughs> like a real uh, a footnote next to this character that is very interesting that you had said that maybe wouldn't necessarily be there if he was left in the film. Yeah, it's um, well. I'm sure people would have paid attention to it because it's again, it is part of Star Wars. But it's 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 interesting how um, it, it it's it's become its own little story in itself, right? And and it's become like a, it, it's kind of it's it's in its own little time ta- capsule because it's not it's not not everyone sees it, so people keep discovering it, and the more they just you know, at, especially with the internet, had the internet not evolved and we not have the internet and that a lot of people probably would have never known about it right uh, and and also you know now you have the blu-ray and the dvds so a lot of the behind the scenes um and that's one of the things that that uh, i've learned over the process in being involved in star wars is i try to tell a lot of filmmakers is uh, make sure that you have cover all your backstory in terms of um, behind the scenes footage behind the scenes story you know 
uh, notes and things like that. All of these little things people are interested in. And if your you know film uh, gets out there and, and and it has any kind of garners any kind of success, then you have that advantage because people want to know about these stories. How is it made? How you know what was it like? They, these are these are all part and parcel of the process. So. While you're making your production or doing your production, even the same with making an album, people love the stories of, of how an album was made. Yeah, that's why we're here today. I'm so glad you're talking to me about it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm a huge, huge James Bond fan, and you were in The Spy Who Loved Me. I'm assuming because you were a, a naval crewman, you were in that big submarine hangar, hangar shootout scene. Is that right? That's right, yeah. What yeah. was that process like? Did you rub elbows with Roger Moore? Um, yeah, I play this one scene where, where it's, it's, uh, I'm with Roger Moore, um, and I'm, we're basically supposed to be bomb disposal experts, but James Bond knows better. <laughs> <laughs> so we're, we're relying on him to save our lives. So, of course. You know, in terms, so there's, there's a few close-ups and there's moments there. And I, I know um, Lewis Gilbert had me come in and, and, uh, and do some reactions at shots and things like that to, to, uh, to what was going on. And that, that, again, another wonderful director to work with. And also, that was the first time, uh, the, the Spy Who Loved Me, that's, that's a huge undertaking. Uh, that was, you know, enormous sets. It was the largest know. set of any set at the time, even bigger than the one in You Only Live Twice, I believe. Yeah, it's, it was a huge, huge soundstage. Uh, I, I actually believe the submarines that are used or, or the mock-up submarines are f to scale. <laughs> You know, that's how large that set stage is, and it was cold as well because you can't heat a, a st sound stage like that. That you know that that's just a, an empty cavern. And it was we we're filming. If I remember, we were filming in December, and it was cold. <laughs> yeah. Well, speaking of being there too, you got to see John Lennon and Yoko Ono on their peace and love campaign, right? And you were actually in the room with them when they were on their bed. Yeah, yeah. What that was. was um, yeah, it's it's. You know, there's been a couple of people over the years who said they wanted to make it into a film, that story, about how, how myself and my, uh, my high school buddy, Bill Duquette, um, ended up cutting classes, hitchhiking into Montreal, and how I bluffed our way through through thick and thin for some reason i just felt i had to be there it was i was very much about the the peace i still am i'm very much you know believer in the, in the peace process and and the fact that you know the we have to find better ways to solve our problems but it was really um the, the preamble to that was there was a lot of discussion in the high school cafeteria uh, with, with myself and some friends and we were trying to figure out all sorts of ways how we were going to get there and eventually everybody kind of, you know, there's one, one friend had his dad worked for, for uh, CTV. He was a, an announcer. So he happened to have a black Cadillac. Um, and we thought, well, we'll take your dad's Cadillac and we'll pull up like we're really important. And they'll let us <laughs> in and stuff. We, we were concocting all these crazy stories. I had no idea and that's so, how you got there. Oh, my God. Yeah. And so eventually everybody kind of chickened out. And, and but what had happened, I was on the, the, uh, the, the cafeteria payphone. And I phoned the Queen Elizabeth Hotel, and I actually, in my insanity, said, can I speak to John Lennon? And they put me through to the room. And it was, I think his name was Tom, and he answered the phone, and he had a British accent. And I just started talking, and I just said, I, 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 made, I was making up stories left, right, and center. I represent high school newspapers, and I need to do this interview and that. Now, the one thing he did say was, he said, well, come on down, bring your press pass with you. And I go, I, I'm mentally, I'm going, I don't have a press pass, but I'm going anyways. <laughs> and so, so uh, I managed to talk Bill, uh, my friend, uh, into uh, joining me. We cut classes and we hitchhiked into Montreal. And when we arrived at the hotel, I, um, they had locked off one of the uh, elevators to only go to that floor. And that was the elevator that had security guards on it and things like that. And so I'd gone over to try and get up and they stopped me. And so I, I did... My, the actor in me went to, to, to work and I started creating a commotion that I had an appointment with Mr. Lennon and I was already late for and they called the hotel manager and he took us upstairs himself. <laughs> and that's how, we, that's, honestly, that's how we got there. And the doors opened to the elevator and the whole floor was taken over and there were press and there were all sorts of people there. Um, I, I can't even remember how many people, you know, all, all various, you know, there's some celebrities. 
Tommy Smothers, I think, uh, Rabbi Feinberg from New York. Um, I don't know if he was there when I was there. Timothy Leary was oh, had been yeah. there. So there was, it was really, you know, and so we were met at the, at the, uh, when the elevator opened and they said, come on in, there's food on the table, get something to eat, have a drink. And it was just a really casual atmosphere and just a, just a wonderful experience. Do you ever stop and think about the paths that have taken you through these monumental moments in history and not like things that transcend pop culture? Star Wars has had such an impact. James Bond being in the room with John and Yoko, is that lost on you day to day or do you, do you, how does that settle with you? That's amazing. Um, it, it's, it's interesting because one of the things that I have four children and one of the things that I've always said to my kids is, is you know, when you go into the world, go into it with your arms open because you, you know, if you close yourself off, you know, from all things, you know, from, from in life, that is, you know, what, what happens is you miss an awful lot of exciting moments and opportunities that may just happen, just, just, just come your way. And so, you know, be giving and, and be loving and good things can come from it. I love that this is some of the most wise words I've heard coming from a sand trooper. <laughs> <laughs> well, you see, sand, you know, the sand troopers get a lot of time to do a lot of thinking because they're stuck out in the <laughs> desert all the time, wandering around, doing, you know, doing their gig. Uh, well, Anthony, thank you so much for talking with me. Is there a place that people can find you online or anything else you want to tell us about? In terms of, of what I'm doing these days, it's it's really getting the, the Ballad of Bob's Garage finished. But I'm also working on an album because there's a, that that's something that I, I moved into. Um, I have for years, I'd, I never knew that I actually... There was see I go busking as well, which is an unusual. I write a lot of songs, and so I, I've finally found a way through busking to actually find a voice for those songs and and be able to um, to be able to perform them. And so now it's it's come to the point where I've decided to actually put an album together of some of the songs that I've been working on because I was originally writing the songs for other people to sing. Then 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 it became um, a realization that unless I actually started performing them, nobody was going to hear them. <laughs> and you have a band camp page, right? This information is also available on your website, which is anthonyforrest.com. That's Forrest yeah, it is. two R's. I've got a, a band camp, like you said, band camp. I think I've got, a, you know, now there's so many options. You, I get very, there's so much you can do with, with, uh, with social media these days. I, I can't keep up with it, to be honest. <laughs> well, thank you for talking to me. It's been a great conversation. I appreciate it. Okay. My pleasure, Matt. Thank you for having me. Thank you once again, Anthony. And the film that Anthony mentioned, The Ballad of Bob's Garage, will be out sometime next year. And you can indeed find his music on Bandcamp at Anthony Forrest, Forrest with two R's, dot bandcamp dot com. So thanks again, Anthony. I was looking for just the right guest to finally tackle Star Wars, and you were an excellent choice. Now, speaking of Star Wars, a couple episodes ago, I had Lauren Lapkus on this program, and she revealed that she had auditioned for Star Wars Episode Eight, but couldn't remember many of the details. And then I recalled that I had a friend that had auditioned for Episode Eight as well, but did know some of the details. So I asked her to sit down with me. She went by the code name Starship One. We had to disguise her voice, pixelate her face, even though this is a podcast. And I asked her about it. But in the interview, no real details came out. Certainly nothing that would really necessitate the secrecy and precautions that we undertook. So I had her back on the show to see if I can get more information from her. Now, I assure you, all of this is real. Starship One, first of all, thank you for coming back and talking to me again. Yeah, of course. Now, people were very intrigued by your first interview where you told us, you at least told us that you had auditioned for Star Wars Episode Eight. But they're also left a little frustrated and a little wanting because you didn't really give any information that would have necessitated disguising your voice. And I'm hoping this time you can tell us a little bit more about your audition process and maybe some details about the movie itself. Well, Matt, I told you as much as I could last time. I told you that the paper was red so it couldn't be photocopied. I told you that... Well, now you're just repeating things that... I'm just wondering if you could give us some some bit of information that might make 
the exclusivity or the secrecy of this interview appropriate? Well, like I said before, it was in Marina Del Rey. Okay, well, that... And it was on the second floor, and they gave me about an hour to go over the lines. So they specifically wanted you to take an hour? I mean, uh, do you typically take an hour to prepare for an audition or a scene? No, but like I said before, there were a lot of lines. There was like two scenes. Well, now we're getting somewhere, so can you tell us anything about any of those lines and the information therein? Well, like I said, we were walking in a planet. In a planet. Through a planet. You were walking through it, like through the core? No, on on the planet. Oh, on the planet. Okay, we covered that last time as well. Okay, we were walking on the planet, in on the planet, and what I can say maybe is that I'm talking to a friend, a male friend, who we're helping each other out. And that the guy's real excited because the place looks cool. Why does it look cool? I think without giving too much away, people are dressed pretty pretty nice. Upscale nice or just fascinatingly nice? I think they're just dressed like not like in robes. All you're willing to say is they're not in robes. They're not. They look... Like they maybe they they look like maybe they lit. I mean, I don't want to give too much away, but they're just not in robes. <laughs> what else can you tell us? Um. Well, there was a girl with short hair in the waiting room. Auditioning for the same part, presumably. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Did your management ever follow up on it or anything? I don't think so. So you never heard another thing. No, I thought at least I'd get a call back, but I guess I was mistaken. Oh, I'm sorry. It's okay. And uh, do you think that when this film comes out, you'll be able to reveal which scene it was and, more importantly, who you are? Uh, I hope so, Matt, because, you know, hiding behind this screen isn't all it's cracked up to be. That's right. I should mention that I can't see you. You're behind a baffle. Is that what you want me to say? This, yes. So even if someone were to torture me, I couldn't give out the information of who you are. That's right. Are you aware that some people are writing online in a few different places, forums, social media, that they think they know who you are? And it's really three people I've heard. Well, who are those three people? You want me to name them? Yeah. One of them is Lauren Lapkus herself, because, of course, this interview happened on the episode where in her Jurassic World interview, she talked about auditioning for episode eight. So they thought maybe that was a bit that I did the same moment. The other is Captain of the Pistol Shrimps, Maria Blasucci. And then the third is my fiance Amanda Lund. Um, Can you confirm or deny it's one of those three people? I can't confirm it. You won't even go that far? No, because I think that would be unfair to all three of those ladies. How do you feel about those ladies? They're pretty cool. <laughs> well, I'm not sure we got any more information out of you this time. I'll give you one last chance to give us some juicy detail that might make this a Star Wars exclusive. Anything? Um. No. Well, then I'm going to let you go. I'm going to let the influx of comments come in. A, theories about who you are, and B, wanting more information. And I, I have a suspicion that we'll speak to you again at some point. Okay, thanks so much, Matt. Thank you, Barbara. No! I know we're just having fun and games there, but that information is true, and I am resolved to get some actual Episode 8 information from that person for this podcast, and maybe even get their identity, at least, at the very least, when the movie's out and safe. I mean, I can't ask them to betray their non-disclosure agreements, but ultimately, I want you, the listener, to have satisfaction. And that's my promise to you, I think. Don't hold me to that, maybe. If you would like to suggest a guest for this show, please email me at IWasThere2Pod at gmail.com. Twitter doesn't help, and please don't tag them in the tweet, because I feel bad if I don't use them. And it's it just, it, it's, uh... There. My tone of voice probably says volumes. But I do appreciate it. You can follow me at Matt Gorley on Twitter, Instagram, and Letterboxd, at IWasThere2 on Twitter. And I do appreciate you listening. 
If you're at the Now Hear This podcast festival, please come up and say hi, and please do come see this show on Saturday the 29th with guest Mark Marin. Thanks, everybody. But hold on. Before we go, this is a Star Wars episode, and it's a podcast, and the first ever podcast I did was called Super Ego. And on there, we did a series of Star Wars sketches that I think you might enjoy. They were about a group of rebel pilots called the Brown Squadron, and this is from the Star Wars Brown Squadron sketch, where they attack the first Death Star. You can find more Super Ego at GoSuperEgo.com, or of course, on iTunes. Next episode, I'll be back with some Empire Strikes Back. I'll be back with some back. Baby do got back. Baby do back. All wings report in. Brown 5, standing by. Brown 3 standing by. Brown 2 standing by. This is Brown 3. No, I'm Brown 3. Wait a minute. Well, that's an 8. I didn't bring my reading glasses. Brown 9 standing by. Brown Bunny standing by. Stabilize your rear deflectors. Watch for enemy fighters. Switching to attack mode. Lock S walls in attack position. And this is red 8 3. Brown. This is Brown 8 3. No, I'm 3. You're 3. Right. Brown 8. God damn it. Who's squadron leader here? I am the leader. It says right here. Oh, look who gets $2 more an hour. Well, I show up on time. That goes a long way. Fuck you. I was late once. We're passing through the magnetic field. Brown 2. Watch your 6. Brown 6. Watch your brown number 2. <laughs> like I haven't heard that one before. You can really feel that magnetic field go through your goo goos. <laughs> Who's with me? It's Brown 3. No, I'm Brown 3. Oh, I'm... Oh, shit! No, that's Brown 2. Very funny. High five, Brown 5. Up. High. Actually, there's no reference point for high or low where we are, so just let's bump cockpits. Here I come. Highway to the danger zone. <laughs> Brown 2 to Brown Leader. My R2 unit is acting up. Take evasive action. Eject! No, no, just eject the R2 unit, not you. Oh, shit. Nobody told him the parachutes don't work at this altitude. Or that we don't even have altitude in space. I've been over there. There's no reference point. Moment of silence for Brown 2. Fuck that. I want to read a poem by William Carlos Williams. Whoever the fuck that is. Vanity. Um, there's TIE Fighters coming in. Type formation, we've got TIE Fighters coming in from North... North? Really? (laughs) North? That's the best you can do, George Lucas! I know you can hear me from your script! Stupid, be careful, there's a TIE Fighter on your tail! I see him. Stiffens, it is I, Obi-Wan Kenobi. You guys hearing that? Only you can hear me, Stiffens. What? I've got a few choice words for you. Guys, I'm freaking out right now. Who are you talking to? They can't hear me, Stiffens. Only you. What do you want? I've got to tell you something. This is very important. Round four, I'm hit! Not yet. I've got to help him. Please, just let me get this out. If I don't, I'm a total wreck. What? Stiffens, this is I. Wait, what? Yes. Are you the same guy that I was just talking to? No, I'm Obi-2 Kenobi. What the? Let go. That's what I was telling you. But with my targeting computer off, I can't target... Just remember, with the panty shield down, you won't be able to see what you're doing. Shut up. Don't touch me, though. Yes. No. Go ahead. More. Mm Mm-hmm. Look, I've got a Darth Vader TIE fighter on my back. How do you know it's him? He's got the bent ion engines. You mean the wing thingies? Those are ion engines. Oh, I thought they were just like solar panels. I thought the engines... Really? Yes. Nice, George. Real brilliant. We can worry about that later. I've got three of them on my tail. Yeah, these flat plate thingies are engines. Suck a cock. I'm going for my attack run. Who the fuck was that? (laughs) I'm sorry, I should have told you. Uh, This is round three again. I'm brown three. Am I brown eight? No, wait. Okay, no, I'm eight. My bad. Go on. Okay, I'm starting my attack run. Does anyone have my six? I do. Hi, pink six. It's me, Janice. Oh, Janice. Yeah, me and the girls are in for three. Three what? Spider ship. You're good for three? Space lasers. You mean you can take out three TIE fighters? Who are they? They're, they're our enemy. They're coming after us. Are they the H's? The a- flying H's? Yes, with the curves. He likes curves. I'm going down the trench. Oh, <laughs> fresh. Thank God for reinforcements. The Titty Squadron's here. Oh, it's him. Ah, bush. <laughs> Hi guys, this is Peter. Uh, I am the liaison 
Department for Communications. That's a fancy SAT word for Complaints Department. Yeah, this is Brown 2. Brown 2, yes. Can I get a new number? You mean you don't like 2? All they do is make number 2 jokes. I get it. Poop. I'll see what I can do. How do you feel about 1? Yeah. And I'll switch you to the yellow group. You could be yellow 1. Oh, I get it. Does you anyone else have anything? Because I got to head back. I'm not actually going to go down in the trench. You must do what you think is right, of course. Yes, Peter. Do what you know to be right. Search your feelings. Don't listen to him. He's a sodomite. Have I ever told you where I'm the most ticklish? This is my first uh, real assault on a Death Star, so it's like you gotta hold my hand a little That's bit. That's great, Peter. I have to go make a brow, too. I heard that. You're dead. Come with me. I'm making my attack run. Who's with me? Fuck that. 60 meters. Spider, coming in. Point three. 50 meters. This is it. 40 meters. Almost there. I've lost my R2 unit. Have you now? 10 meters. Stay on target. 15 meters. Stay on target. 20 meters. I'm fucking going backwards. I don't know how this is happening. Pick up your visual scanning. 30 meters. What the fuck? Watch it. You've got one on your tail. 10 meters. Okay, I'm back on track. I had a computer malfunction. Use the force. Torpedo away. <laughs> What's up? This is Hannibal Burris, and I got a new podcast coming out soon on the Ill Wolf Network. It's called Handsome Rambler. It's going to be me talking about life on the road, sports, relationships, philosophy, books. Anything can happen on the Handsome Rambler. It's going to be an extravaganza. Check it out. The Handsome Rambler coming soon on the Ill Wolf Network. You know what it is. <sighs> This episode of I Was There Too is also brought to you by the Nuisance Committee. And the following is a paid message about the presidential election. During World War II, President Roosevelt signed an executive order to imprison Japanese Americans in concentration camps. American citizens who had done nothing wrong lost their jobs, their businesses, and their freedom. Families were torn apart, and children grew up behind barbed wire fences. Today, Japanese-American imprisonment during World War II is considered a stain on the legacy of American history. In 1988, President Reagan paid reparations to innocent Japanese-Americans who were wrongly imprisoned and issued a formal apology. When we look back at that history today, it is tempting to wonder, how could this have happened? How could we have been so scared of our neighbors that we locked them up. How did the land of the free get it so wrong? Donald Trump says that when he's president, an armed deportation force will occupy American cities. Trump's deportation task force will investigate innocent people and round them up into concentration camps. Trump says he'll ban all Muslims from entering our country. Donald Trump's plan has once again caused neighbors to fear one another and turned Americans against our own people. This election is a test. Can we learn from the mistakes of our past and reject Trump's cruel, unconstitutional prison camps? Or are we doomed to repeat history? This November, the choice should be easy for all patriotic Americans. We must vote against American concentration camps, and we must vote against Donald Trump. The Nuisance Committee is responsible for the content of this advertising. This has been an Earwolf production, executive produced by Scott Ackerman, Adam Sachs, and Chris Bannon. For more information and content, visit Earwolf.com. Earwolf.